Woods to Holland. Maastricht, grimly defended by the Nazis, is swept into the Allied bag. Its citizens are Dutch folk, and they give their liberators a very different welcome from the nervous smiles of the Heron folk. So, through another liberated town, the Allies sweep on to give the Germans a taste of war on their own soil. to Holland. Maastricht, grimly defended by the Nazis, is swept into the Allied bag. Its citizens are Dutch folk, and they give their liberators a very different welcome from the nervous smiles of the Heron folk. So, through another liberated town, the Allies sweep on to give the Germans a taste of war on their own soil. to Holland. Maastricht, grimly defended by the Nazis, is swept into the Allied bag. Its citizens are Dutch folk, and they give their liberators a very different welcome from the nervous smiles of the Heron folk. So, through another liberated town, the Allies sweep on to give the Germans a taste of war on their own soil. to Holland. Maastricht, grimly defended by the Nazis, is swept into the Allied bag. Its citizens are Dutch folk, and they give their liberators a very different welcome from the nervous smiles of the Heron folk. So, through another liberated town, the Allies sweep on to give the Germans a taste of war on their own soil. Hello everyone, welcome to this live stream and presentation. Now, despite the current crisis, it is still important to commemorate and remember the end of the Second World War in a dignified and interconnected oh, way. And with Battle for Tours, we also want to reflect on 75 years of freedom, and that is why we have decided to organize a number of online lectures. Uh, Today we have the uh, privilege that historian and guide Frank Goebbels uh, will give a presentation about the first liberators on Dutch soil. Uh, the 30 Infantry Division, also known as Old Hickory, was the first Allied unit to set foot on Dutch soil. And during this presentation, Frank is going to follow their part and also share some personal stories. Uh, good luck, uh, uh, Frank, with this, uh, I think, impressive uh, presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Joel, and I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to give a presentation about the 30th Infantry Division in the Netherlands. And I have to slightly correct you a little bit because we are liberated over 76 years oh, ago yeah. already because oh, yeah. we were liberated 
in September 1944. I know in your part it was 1945. Yeah, yeah. you're right. It's not a problem at all. And we're going to main, mainly we're going to focus on the 30th Infantry Division, as you said, nicknamed All Hickory, and they were nicknamed after one of the former presidents of the United States, and that was President Andrew Jackson. On the left-hand side of the screen, you can see the patch of the 30th Infantry Division. And if you look closely, you see a large O, the blue O, which represents old. And inside that O is a large blue H, which is Hickory. And inside the H, you can see three crosses, 30th Infantry Division. So each cross represents 10, three crosses, 30th, and that's the meaning of the patch of the 30th Infantry Division. Next to it, you can also see the patches of the uh, infantry regiments. And on the top, you can see the 117th Infantry Regiment. In the middle, you can see the 119th Regiment. And at the bottom, you can see the 120th Regiment. We're going to mainly, we're going to focus on the 117th and 119th Regiments. And well, I have to tell you that the 30th Infantry Division landed our beach about one week after D-Day and from there on they moved on through Normandy and I don't know if I am going to pronounce all the names of the towns correctly I'm not going to name all towns of course but places like Isigny-sur-Mer, saint jean de daye Vire and then the big battle at Mortain and they were just a few months finally recognized with a uh, presidential unit citation as an entire division. And so that took about seven or even over 76 years before they were recognized, although they were put up for it directly after World War II. And from there on, the rat race started. And the 30th Infantry Division, they moved, I have to say moved, but it was more like a race, but they moved through France. They just bypassed Paris on the northern side and they were the first troops to enter Belgium in early September 1944. They were also the first troops to enter the Netherlands. And that's the part we're going to focus on, of course. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit further for now because they broke through the secret line. They also participated in the Battle for Aachen. They participated in the Battle of the Bulge. They were there at the, at the Ruhr River crossing and they ended up in the city of Magdeburg in Germany. So it was within one year of being at the front line, the 30th Infantry Division, as I said, landed about a week after D-Day on, Nor on the Normandy beaches uh, with 15,000 men. Within a year, they had 3,435 men being killed in action, 12,960 wounded in action, 753 missing in action and 543 prisoners of war. So you can see they had a, a lot of casualties during the entire war. It's over 100%. And they were also ranked as the number one infantry division in the ETO by the uh, Chief of Staff General SLA Marshall. Well, when they moved up into Belgium in early September 1944, that was, the rat race was still going on a little bit. And here you can see men of the 30th Infantry Division moving to the right as they were coming from the right hand side from the uh, Belgium city of Tongeren. And you can see it on the road sign. Tongeren is eight kilometers to the right. The city of Maastricht in the Netherlands is 10 kilometers to the left. So they are going south. And this is in a small Belgian village called Herdere. And I'm going to show you a little map. And well, there's this green line on the map. The green line is not completely correct because you can see the city of Tongeren is further to the north. Okay, the 30th Infantry Division was not the first division to enter the city of Tongeren, but they moved on towards the east. And you can see there's a highway right now. But if you move on to the east, then you can see in the top of the screen, that small village called Herdere. So that's where they made that right turn and moved further south until they reached, now I'm going to make it easy now, until they reached number 110. 
And that's where the 117th and 119th regiments had to cross the Meuse River. And that was in a place called Hermal sous Argento. They were also uh, accompanied by a squadron of the 113th Cavalry Group, the 113th Squadron. And maybe you're wondering what the 120th Infantry Regiment did. Well, the 120th Regiment moved up to the top right of the screen because that, there is a little village called Eben Emal, and that's quite a famous Belgian town, as that's where the famous fortress of Eben Emal is. And on September 11, 1944, that's when the 120th Regiment took the fortress of Eben Emal without firing a single shot. That's the same day that the 117th and 119th Regiment arrived at number 110. And they had to cross the Meuse River. Well, they did that. They did that in small boats and they got some help from Belgian resistance people. The 113th Squadron, they couldn't cross up there. As you can see, the bridge had been blown up. So the 113th Squadron had to move further south towards the city of Liège, which is about 10 miles further south. As in Liège, there was one bridge which was not blown up by the Germans. And 113 Squadron moved south, then had to move those 10 miles back up north, but they had to stay together. And in the early morning of September 11, 1944, the 117th and 119th Regiments, they crossed at first the Albert Canal and then the Meuse River. And this is a picture of them crossing the Meuse River. And if you take a good look, you can see that building with a tower in the center of the picture. And I was lucky enough because quite a while ago we went, in, we were still allowed to go into Belgium, which we still are, but it's better not to do right now. But you can see the same tower right here in this picture. So I'm going back to show you the former picture. So this is how it looked like in 1944. And Unfortunately, the rocks you can see in the, in the far distance up there, well, they were in the shade when I took this picture, but they are still there. This is the exact same spot where the man crossed in 1944. And I do have another picture. As you can see, the bridge, again, had been blown up. But in the top right of your screen, you can see another building with a triangle roof. That building is also still there. Most of the buildings are still there. You can see it right here again. So we've got some comparisons right now to see how it looks like, although the situation has changed on the other side of the river. And when the two regiments crossed the Meuse River, they established a bridgehead on the eastern side of the river. So where the buildings are right now, that's the eastern side of the river. As the two infantry regiments, of course, had to wait because they had to connect with the 113th Squadron. And that was only in late on September 11 when they were all joined together. And of course, the bridgehead was larger than what you can see in the picture right now. But they didn't move up any further until the morning of September 12 when they moved up to the village of Vizé. And from there on, they moved up to the Belgium Dutch border. So this is what we would say this is when. The liberation of the Netherlands starts with crossing the Meuse River. That gave him the opportunity to move further north towards the border of the, uh, of the Netherlands. And if you take a look at this map in the lower left part of the map, unfortunately, there's not a very decent map of where the Meuse River crossing happened. That's just a little bit further down than where my arrow is right now. But they moved up to Vizé. And then they moved to the village of Mullingen. And you can see the border right here. And you can see that small village, Mesh. I do have a different map because this might make it easier for you to follow not only the regiments, but also the battalions within the regiments. Because that is what we're mainly going to talk about. I'm going to name companies as well. But mainly we're going to follow the battalions. And first battalion, which we're going to follow, is 
first uh, first battalion 117th regiment which is the red line which you can see right here another thing i want to point out before we go before we're going cr to cross the border is that there is a small village right here in the netherlands which is called bonnold and in that village the german commander uh, general lieutenant hanschmidt he had put up his headquarters up there and he put it up there just a couple of days before the Americans would arrive at the Belgian Dutch border. But on, in the morning of September the 12th, 1944, that's when he left his headquarters together with his assistant and a driver because they were going to drive around to check on the front line because he had heard about the Americans crossing the Meuse River, but he didn't expect it to be a large a unit it was more like maybe they're doing some patrols or so. So he was going to check on the uh, German front line, and for some reason he ended up just south of Mesh in Belgium. And right here you can see a picture of General Lieutenant Hans Schmidt on the left hand side of uh, of your screen with the patch of the 275th German Infantry Division. And this road, this is the road that General Lieutenant Hans Schmidt drove down because his driver took a wrong turn. And they were driving down this road, and it must have been in this area here, because further down the road is, is, is a crossroad. He bumped into the Americans. And he witnessed, he witnessed a lot of Americans up there. So they wanted to leave their car, and of course, the Americans opened fire on them. Uh, the driver was killed instantly. The assistants was wounded and later on captured by the Americans, General Lieutenant Hans Schmidt. He suffered from a flesh wound in his hip, but managed to get away on hand and feet towards the village of Mesh, which is to the right. And you can see the dirt road right up here. That is one of the dirt roads leading up to Mesh. And General Lieutenant Hans Schmidt, he arrived in Mesh, and that's when he told some other Germans that, I don't know the, the, how uh, highly ranked the officers were up there, but he's, he told them one thing, we still have a briefcase in my car. So the Germans, they launched an attack with about 150 guys because they wanted to have that briefcase. Of course, they couldn't get back to the car and the Americans had already found that briefcase. And that briefcase was uh, handed over to Lieutenant Elwood G. Dado from B Company, 1st Battalion, 117th. And when he looked through the maps in that briefcase, he noticed how important those maps were because it showed all the defensive positions from the Germans until you would reach the Siegfried line. But it also contained the strategic withdrawal of the Germans. So the Americans all of a sudden had the complete plan of the Germans in the southern part of the Flimberg province. And, well, when the Germans opened that attack, there was also one American who was being killed. And I forgot to mention one thing. Uh, I think most of you are very familiar with the miniseries called Band of Brothers. And in episode two, there's Lieutenant Dick Winters finding those maps at, during the Battle of Brecourt. Actually, I have to admit that the maps found in the briefcase of General Lieutenant Hans Schmidt were ranked higher than the ones Dick Winters found in Brekoe, but that's just a side story. But when the Germans opened that attack, well, there was a firefight, and one of the Americans, by the name of Leonard Hoffman, of A Company, 1st Battalion, 117th Regiment, he was, uh, he was killed in action, unfortunately. And he was killed in action right in this area, in this field. To the left of the field, you can still see the road going down to the crossroads. So that road that General Lieutenant Hanschmidt drove down. And to, on the top left, you can see a picture of Leonard Hoffman. On the right side of the screen, you can see his grave at Henry Chappelle Cemetery in Belgium. Where, his, where he found his final resting place. But Leonard Hoffman, his ancestors, they were from the Netherlands. And 
as far as I know, there are still some uh, uh, family members of his living in the northern part of the Netherlands. So, well, maybe that's something interesting for you. Um, but I have to say, Leonard Hoffman, he just didn't reach the border. Well, here you can see the same dirt road. To the left, you just can see the edge of the field where Leonard Hoffman was killed in action. On the right-hand side of that dirt road, that's where you can see the border marker. That road is at that spot, the border between Belgium and the Netherlands, for about 100 yards. If you move, move up for 100 yards, you will reach this area. And I know it's very difficult to see, but there is a stone right here, and I put it in a larger picture down here. That's a former border marker, but that's where the Americans moved further up. So if you follow my arrow, that's how the Americans advanced, and that's where the grass is. That's where, when they were completely in the Netherlands. This happened on September 12th at 10 a.m. in the morning. So that's where the first Americans, that's what they say, crossed the border during the liberation of the Netherlands. I know there are stories from September the 9th, 1944, that there were Americans in the outskirts of Maastricht. It's not a verified story, but there are people who witness it, who say they witnessed it. So I'm going to be careful on this, but during the liberation of the Netherlands, this is the first spot where the Americans crossed the border between Belgium and the Netherlands. Well, a Company, 1st Battalion, 117th Regiment, was the first unit to cross the border up here. And they were under the command of Captain John Kent. And you can see Captain John Kent on the left-hand side of the picture. The captain with the mustache and next to him is Florian Lonezak. That picture was taken afterwards. This is, has not been taken in mesh. This picture was taken at the Rolduk Abbey in Kerkrade, the Netherlands, about two months after the liberation started. Captain John Kent survived World War II, and as far as I know, he died in the early 2000s. Um, but under his command, the first American troopers crossed the Belgium-Dutch border. And if you follow that dirt road, you will, for a couple of minutes, you will enter the village of Mesh, where you can see a monument. And even if you're standing in front of the monument, it's kind of hard to read. But it says that in the early morning of September the 12th, 1944, at 10 a.m., men of the 30th Infantry Division crossed the belgium Dutch border, and that's where the liberation of the Netherlands started. And you can see they also in, inaugurated, and that was during the 75th anniversary, September 2019, they inaugurated a plaque to commemorate Leonard Hoffman. On the other side of that dirt road, so the monument is on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, there's another building, which I recently found out is not a cafe anymore, but it was a cafe back then, and that's the first liberated cafe in the Netherlands. So as you can see, first things first for the Americans, and there was one inhabitant of Mesh, Mr. Warnier, he was waiting for the Americans and he was able to speak a couple of words in English and he welcomed the Americans into the Netherlands and told the Americans you are the first Americans to enter the Netherlands. And he gave them a little jar of ink, which was well, really nice to the Americans because they had to use it to write down the reports and everything. In return, the Americans handed him a package of Raleigh, or Raleigh, I don't know how to pronounce it, cigarettes. And that was, well, fine tobacco for somebody who couldn't smoke a decent tobacco in four and a half years of occupation. But if you want to go to the first liberated village of the Netherlands, you need to be in this village, which is called Mesh. Although, I'm talking about first liberated village. I'm talking about the first liberated uh, cafe. In Mesh, you will not find the first liberated building of the Netherlands. As 
Mesh was only liberated somewhere between 2 and 3 p.m. As you remember, the Germans had made that attack. So the Americans had to fight their way into Mesh, and the Germans had put up a machine gun. So it took quite a while for the Americans to enter the village. In the meantime, other Americans, and those were men from the 113th Cavalry Squadron, and the 113th Cavalry Group is also nicknamed the Red Horse. They were protecting the left flank of the 30th Infantry, uh, of the 117th Infantry Regiment. And they were moving up north and were going to follow their left flank. And right here, where they crossed the border, just a little bit further north, that's where you will find the first liberated building in the Netherlands, which is a farmhouse, which is called the Mughoff. And the inhabitants of the Mughoff, the Smith's family, well, luckily, they had a camera. And they saved the camera to take pictures during a special occasion. And that would become the liberation. You can see how the farmhouse looks nowadays. It hasn't changed much in 76 years. And maybe you're asking yourself, why is there a Dutch flag up there? Because that's dangerous. Well, that's correct. They came out with the Dutch flags, the, the, with the Dutch flag. The Americans didn't want the people to put up the Dutch flag, but allowed them to take a picture with the Dutch flag, and then they had to move the flag back into the house because the Germans were still observing the area. And if the Germans could see a flag, they knew exactly where the Americans were. So it was just for less than a minute when that flag was put up. And then they put it back into the into the house. And okay, posts they have changed, but you can see the window and the roof up there. But that's still there. And luckily, they took more than one picture because you can see man of the 113 squadron moving in on this road towards the Mughal farm. And then they took a right turn. They were moving up north towards. This, uh, the village called Eisen. I do have another now and then, and you can see the bumper marking, it says 113th Cavalry. You can see that's a part of that same window again. And in the post up here, you can barely read the last few letters of the word Mughoff, which is, well, lit, literally translated like mosquito farm. And this is the same place. So you can see the post, they have changed, but where that half track was driving was right here, because you can see the window and the roof. So again, I'm going to do a little re resume. First American troopers to cross the Belgian Dutch border was just outside Mesh. First liberated village is the village of Mesh, was the first liberated cafe, but the first liberated farmhouse first liberated building in the Netherlands. That's a Mughal farm just south of the village of Ais. And we have been on the left side of the 117th and the 119th uh, and the 113th uh, regiment. We're going to go a little bit to the right as we're going to follow the 119th regiment as well. And particularly 3rd Battalion of the 119th, which is, if you follow the arrow, this blue line up here, and they crossed the border in this area and then moved into the village of Norby. That was only late in the afternoon of September 12th. And this picture was not taken on September 12th, most likely the 13th, might even be the 14th of September 1944. Some of the trees have disappeared, but it almost still looks the same right here in, in my hometown, <laughs> I can tell you. And you can see that road coming up right here. That's the road that the man, K Company, 3rd Battalion, 119th Regiment used to enter the village. And one of those men was Private First Class Kenneth C. Taylor. And Kenneth C. Taylor, well, we have been in touch with him. 
before he passed away in 2010. And he remembered coming through the village of Norvik. Although his memory was mixed up a little bit, but he wrote a letter. He has never been back in this area. And he said, well, we crossed the border, but we didn't know we crossed the border. And all of a sudden we entered the village, there was a farmhouse, and that farmhouse, well, the owner had some beautiful birds. And later on, he learned that those birds were golden pheasants. And he said, we walked along that farmhouse, came at a building at the corner of, of a road junction, and there was some sort of gate which was painted very strangely, like diagonal. And from there on, it was about 100 yards to the square in the town. And that's where I saw a road sign. And above one of the uh, uh, shops in, in the square, I could see a text. And that text was written in Dutch. And that's when I said to the other guys, hey, we must be in Holland right now. Well, a building with that date is not there anymore. The building is still there, but it has changed. But I told you, they came up this road just a little bit further to the left-hand side. That's where that same building is because you can still see the three windows nowadays in that building. And they, these two buildings are still there as well. But it has changed slightly. But for someone who had never returned for 65 years when we contacted him, that's Absolutely correct, because it's about 100 yards from that gate towards the main square. And if you take a closer look right here, yes, there was a road sign there in 1944. So that's absolutely correct. Although Kantea says that this happened during a listening patrol on September 11th. Well, to my knowledge, a listening patrol is never about 25 kilometers long, single road. So they had to, re to get back. And the next day, with the other guys, they came back and liberated the village of Norby. So most likely he was mixed up there. And there might have been a patrol, but what he saw in our village, that must have been on September the 12th. And another person, uh, before I'm coming to that, I'm going to show you another then and now. Maybe some people have seen the presentation with the live feed from Paul Woodage, well, we were in, the, in my hometown as well, and I had different pictures. So I wanted to share a different now and then. As you can see, this picture on the left, that was taken on September 12, 1944. And you can still, still see the curve in the road. These are troopers of K Company, 119th Regiment. As we were also lucky that one family, the Raven family, they also saved the camera. And they took 13 pictures during the liberation. And the reason why I want to show you this picture on the left is because this is the actual liberation of the village of Norby. One of the men who was also in K Company, 119th Regiment, that was Staff Sergeant Roy L. Boer. And Staff Sergeant Boer, he was with the first man who entered my hometown, when they entered the village of Norbeck, they bombed into a German truck. A firefight happened and the German truck driver was killed. Later on, they left the village because they, had, they hadn't reached their regimental objective, which was the main road at a small hamlet called Linden. And about one kilometer outside the village of Norbeck, that's when they got to another small hamlet, and the owner of the farmhouse came up to them and he said, hold on. And there are Germans in the woods on the other side of that hill. But that hill was only 300 yards away from the Americans. Actually, I have to tell you that the owner of that farmhouse did not speak any English, but he spoke French. And there was one guy in K Company who was able to understand French. So he translated to the others. And it was Staff Sergeant Roy Boer who took one other guy with him to do some recon. And they moved up along a hedgerow, which was going along the road. And Roy Boer decided to jump over that hedgerow. 
And at the moment he jumped over that hatch row, he was hit in his in the right hand side of his chest by a German bullet. An American medic tried to get to him, but was unable to reach him. And because of the German fire, the others couldn't advance as well. So that's when the man from K Company, that's when they called in for air support. But it took about an hour and a half before three fighter planes, and we believe those will be P-51 Mustangs, when they showed up from three different angles and they started strafing the woods on that hill. And K Company stopped at that spot. L Company had already made a movement on the other side uh, of the home of my hometown, and they took to the small village of Trelinde. The body of Roy Boer was only brought back to the rear on September the 13th. And until 2007, there was nobody who ever spoke about it. And by chance, we got, we were able to listen to some people who witnessed an American trooper being killed in action. It took us one year with four guys, and you can see four of us in the bottom of uh, in the bottom picture. And well, it took us one year to identify him, and then it took another year to put up a monument near the spot where he was killed in action. Because in the 1990s, to put up a pump station right at the spot where he was killed in action, so it's about 20 yards away from where Roy was killed in action. But during that uh, research we did in 2007 and 2008, that's when we found out that during the liberation of the Netherlands, Staff Sergeant Roy L. Boer was the first American trooper to be killed in action on Dutch soil. So not the first American to be killed in the Netherlands, as in the, for example, in 1943, American planes had been shot down. But during the actual liberation of the Netherlands, it was Staff Sergeant Boer who was the first man who was killed in action on Dutch soil. And he is also buried at Henry Chappelle Cemetery. And we were really honored in September 2019 to have a few veterans from the 30th Infantry Division who attended a ceremony at the monument and we visited the grave of Roy Boer. And these are pictures we received from his family on the left hand side. On the left, you can see Staff Sergeant Roy Boer. On the right side of that picture is his twin brother, Ray Boer, who also served in the 30s Infantry Division. And a few days after Roy had been killed, Ray already learned about it. And he never spoke about it. He survived the war, was wounded four times. And after this fourth time during the Battle of the Bulge, he was sent back to the United States, never spoke about it, pass away already in 1980. And the picture on the right is also a picture of Staff Sergeant Roy Boer. Both pictures, of course, taken in the United States before both men went overseas. Well, we have been talking about September 11 in Belgium. We have been talking about September the 12th when they crossed the border. We're going back to the 1st Battalion of the 117th Regiment, that red line. And if you follow me, they went through a village called Sint Geertruid, then they went up to Ekelrade, and they went up to the village called Kadir and Keer. But right between the villages of Ekelrade and Kadir and Keer, a rather famous picture has been taken. And that's this picture right here. And if you take a very good look, so follow my arrow, Right here, you can just see the steeple of the church of Kadir and Keir. So they were going through the fields. And these are actually men of C Company, 117th Regiment, moving up towards Kadir and Keir on September 13, 1944. And this is how the field looked in 2014, as two veterans of the 30th Infantry Division Dick Lacey and Peter Munger returned to the Netherlands and they walked that same field. Although they didn't walk through that field in 1944, well, 
I know Jürgen Mengels has taken this picture. It must have been a lot of emotional things go going through their head when veterans of that same division are walking through the same field. And of course, the trees have grown, so you don't see the church steeple right now. And you can see the orchard has disappeared. But this is the exact field, and I'm going to show it again right here, September 13, 1944. And this is 2014, so six years ago. And in the meantime, and on the top right, I added a little picture. You can see Dick Lacey on the left hand side of that picture and Peter Munger on the right hand side. Unfortunately, Dick left us a couple of years ago. Peter is still with us, luckily. And both men walked that same field. And it was 1st Battalion, 117th Regiment, which liberated that Dutch town of Kadir and Keer. And one of the men who liberated Kadir and Keer was Albert Strahle Jr. He served in B Company, 1st Battalion, 117th Regiment. And well, Kadir and Keer, the Americans had taken the main road and went into the village. And Albert Strahler was killed in action by German shrapnel. The Germans, they fired a couple of shells into the village and one piece of shrapnel hit Albert Strahler in his left shoulder. And unfortunately, the, the wound was mortal and he was killed in action. In 2009, a monument was inaugurated near the spot where Albert was killed in action in the Dutch town of Kadir and Keer. And you can see because this picture was taken in 2009 with, during the inauguration. You can see American veterans, 30th Infantry Division, John D'Agostino, Dick Lacey, Frank Towers, and Vic Nyland, who attended the ceremony. Then on the picture on the right, you can see the three generations, as these are family members of Albert Strahler, who visited the monument in 2019, placed flowers uh, to commemorate their family member. And I know the people who put up this monument, well, I can tell you from my own experience, it's a very emotional road you're going through with doing the research and of course finding family members and learning what has happened to that specific trooper. Two men from Kadir and Keer, Harry Beckers and Jürgen Mingels, they went up to Mission, Texas, where Albert Strahler is buried nowadays as his body was repatriated in 1948. And his father, Albert Strahler Sr., had built a mausoleum in Mission, Texas. And normally, you're not allowed to go into a mausoleum. Luckily, Harry Beckers, who was on the left of the picture, and Jürgen Mengels, who was on the right, luckily they were allowed to go, to go into the mausoleum and see the plaque at the exact spot where Albert Strahler is resting right now. And of course, but and again, I'm going to say something which I, I believe has to be true, but that is something people have to do. They open the mausoleum because you really have a connection. You have the connection with not only the family, but with the entire place where he was coming from, in, in this case, Mission, Texas. And I think it's a really beautiful thing that people in the United States open that mausoleum for them. And of course, Americans are always coming up like, thank you for taking care. Well, I don't want people to come up to say thank you because it is the less we can do. We have to keep the memory alive, not only the, the memory of the veterans, but also the men whose lives were taken away and their lives had been cut short. And that's something we must not forget. And more than half of the men who were killed in action are reburied in the United States. So if you ever get up into a cemetery and you see a dirty stone from a World War II 
soldier, please clean it up because that's what they deserve. And I'm going a little bit further right now. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting one thing. I'm going back to this picture. Because September, I told you this happened on September the 13th. But on September the 14th, it's just a short story, but on September the 14th, there was still a couple of Germans in this area. And you can see the trees up there. Well, right in that area, that's where Jürgen's father and his grandfather, in the morning of September the 13th, they were milking the cows. And finally, they could do that while they were free. And Jürgen's father, who is in his 80s right now, he remembered that something just whistled by his ear. And for a split second, he didn't know what it was. And then he heard the gunshot. And they heard a second gunshot. And they dropped to the ground, started crawling until they reached Petro. And then they started to make their way back to the hometown of Kadir and Keir. And it turned out that there was still another German in that area. And he was shooting at, at the civilians, at Jürgen's father and grandfather. So luckily, that German missed. And later on, that German was killed in action, as they found it. But even on the 14th, the day after the liberation, it was quite dangerous. OK, now I'm going to go to this map up here. So I have no idea how I'm doing time-wise, but I think I will hear something when I will be overdue with time with this presentation. So we have followed 1st Battalion, 117th Regiment, the Red Line. We're going to follow 2nd Battalion of the 117th right now, which is that purple line right up here. And that purple line is going through a small hamlet called, called Bethais, which was liberated on September 12th already. And then they moved on towards a village called St. Geertreid. And that was liberated on September the 13th. They moved on until they reached this part right here. And that's where they are going into the area which we know as Maastricht right now. And the eastern side of Maastricht, as you can see the Meuse River, it's coming up right here through Maastricht. Well, the eastern side was liberated on September 13th. And that side is also known as Week. The western side was only liberated on September the 14th. And in the early morning of September the 14th, that's when 2nd Battalion of the 117th, so the man on that purple line, that's when they crossed the Meuse River in small boats. So they had to cross the Meuse River again. Now they had to cross it from east to west. And one of those men who was in one of those boats, that was John P. O'Hare from E Company, 2nd Battalion, 117th Regiment. And John O'Hare, luckily also still with us, 95 years of age. And John remembers the liberation of Maastricht. And why does he remember it? Because John already in northern France somewhere, jumped off a wall. And he went up to a medic after that, and he said to the medic, well, I think I just broke both my feet. And the only thing the medic told him was, you're only a private. What do you know? Get your ass back to the front line right now. So John had to go back to the front line. And he was on foot crossed the French-Belgian border, walked through Belgium, then crossed the Belgian-Dutch border on September the 12th, liberated Maastricht, was one of the liberators of Maastricht on September the 14th, and shortly after the liberation of Maastricht, John went up to a different medic. He never took his boots off because he knew my feet will swell and I can't put my boots back on. Plus the fact 
you always keep your boots on. If the Germans make a surprise attack, you don't want to be caught by surprise and be on bare feet. So at, shortly after the liberation of Maastricht, John went up to a different medic and that medic took his boots off. He looked at his feet and he said, John, you've got two broken feet. So for about two weeks, John had walked a few hundred kilometers on two broken feet. That's when he was evacuated back, even back to England. They had to break both of his feet again. So that's why he missed the Battle of the Bulge. He doesn't have any problem with that, but later returned to E Company and served with E Company until the end of the war. But he said, I remember being a mastery because we slept in the front yard of a building. We crossed the Meuse River and helped liberate the western side of Maastricht. And after that, I went to the medic. It was not only 2nd Battalion of the 117th Regiment which liberated the western side, because from the west coming in was 2nd Battalion of the 120th Regiment. So they were just encircling the Germans in the city. Not too much of a fighting went on, but Maastricht became the first liberated city of the Netherlands. They were occupied for four years, four months, and four days. But unfortunately, things had been going wrong a few weeks before the liberation. As the Allies had tried to bomb the, uh, the railroad bridge in Maastricht, but they missed the target. And there were quite a lot of civilian casualties. So, yeah, there were the people were happy to be liberated, but there was that bitterness also because a lot of men, people lost family members. This picture, I do have a couple of then and now pictures in Maastricht. I don't have a picture uh, now picture of the position where the Meuse crossing took place as in the 1960s. They built a huge bridge up there, so you don't see the exact spot and the buildings in the background have disappeared. But right here in this Jeep, you can see that this is the uh, regimental commander, Colonel Johnson, and they're pointing out where he needs to go. But if you take a look in the top left of that picture at that building, you can see that that building is still there. So this is the exact same spot where the regimental commander was. And shortly before the Americans arrived, the Germans had blew up the bridges in Maastricht. As you can see in the background of the 1944 picture, and this picture taken in 2019, you can see it still looks quite the same up there, except for the bicycles, but that's typical Dutch. And bridge has been rebuilt as it was really badly damaged. You can see the same bridge, which is called the old bridge. And the damage has been repaired. But there were people in Maastricht, resistance people, who tried to cut the wires so the Germans couldn't blow up the bridges. But of course, that didn't work out. So the Germans were able to blow the bridges in Maastricht. And I just want to show you this as a then and now comparison. So I'm telling you the stories, but it seems that not much of a fighting had been going on in this area. Well, you're correct if you compare it to the Battle of the Bulge or the Battle for Normandy. Yes, because the Germans, they were still pulling back, pulling back towards the Siegfried line. Although the rat race had come to an end, as the lines, had, uh, the supply lines had stretched way too too long, so they couldn't get too many supplies. Plus the fact, as everybody knows, on September the 17th, that's when Operation Market Garden started, and they needed a lot of supplies as well. So we were lucky that we were already liberated by that time. And I have to tell you that the area we are living in was not an objective for the Americans. The objective was the German city of Aachen. And to the north, that's where the Ruhr area is, the industrial area of Germany. Those were two large objectives for the Americans, and we were just 
right in between. So that's why we were liberated a little bit earlier. And in Maastricht, they really, they really celebrate the liberation. And believe it or not, but on March 7, 1945, they already liberate, celebrated their liberation, just, sh just short of six months of liberation. And they invited one battalion of the 30th Infantry Division to participate in uh, the liberation. And that was 2nd Battalion, 117th Regiment. And you can see the man of 2nd Battalion standing up there. Well, it looks more like a company size, but they had already lost a lot of men because they were pulled off the front line for a few days. They were allowed to go to Maastricht for one day, then they went back into Germany because they were already in Germany, but they had to train for their next attack. But one of these men on this picture, and I'm going to point him out, this man right here, he's quite tall. That is John O'Hare. So remember, John O'Hare had two broken feet, but after the Battle of the Bulls, he rejoined E Company, and in March, March 7, 1945, he was one of the men who returned to Maastricht for one day to celebrate the liberation. And it was only in September 2019 that I finally was able to be at the same square in Maastricht with John. You can see they were celebrating the liberation, but on the lower left side, that's John O'Hare underneath that red and white umbrella. That's John O'Hare. He was standing somewhere around there in 1945. But this is the closest I could get for now and then with John on a picture in 2019. And I think that's really amazing to have one of those men at the same square 75 years, almost 75 years later. And that can make a little bit of a different map because there's, no, there's one more city, I have to say, a small city, which I want to talk about. And that's the small city of Valkenburg. We're going to talk about 1st Battalion, 119th Regiment. And 1st Battalion, 119th Regiment also crossed the border between Belgium and the Netherlands on September 12, 1944. They went through villages called Meer, Bonnold, Mark Rotten, which might be known right now because that's the place where the only American cemetery in the Netherlands is. And that's when they moved further north until on September uh, 14th, in the early morning, that's when they reached Valkenburg. And to make it complete, I have to call it Valkenburg on the go. They came down, and this is where they enter Valkenburg itself. And you can see how it looks like nowadays. So the buildings have changed a little bit, but yes, it still looks quite the same. And Americans came into the village, uh, came into the city, and not too much happened. Only one bridge by that time had not been blown up by the Germans. And the Americans were really close when one German blew that bridge right in front of their face. And that's when it became difficult, because Falkenberg is located in, in some sort of small valley, and the Germans were still occupying the high grounds on the other side with artillery. So that's when the Americans had to cross a small river called the Gueule River. And that took quite a while. And the Americans nicknamed Falkenberg as pain in the ass, because that's the place where they, for the first time, had some serious firefights since they had left Normandy. And that was one month earlier. And one of the men of 1st Battalion, 119th Regiment, Able Company, that was Henry Morgan. And you can see Henry Morgan sitting on a jeep, picture taken in Valkenburg. And that picture had been taken uh, about two days before Henry Morgan was killed in action. On the bottom, you can see that same place where that picture had been taken. So you can see the terrace has changed 
a bit, but that's the exact same spot. And Henry Morgan, on uh, September the 16th, when they had just crossed the Gull River, so two days already after they entered uh, Valkenburg, that's when he was resting with a couple of guys and the Germans fired uh, their guns again. And one shell hit a pillar of the villa next to them. And a piece of shrapnel hit Henry Morgan in the chest. And he was seriously wounded in action. He crawled into the building, trying to find some help, but also trying to find shelter. And before he could reach the basement, he already died of his wounds. And just over a week after he was killed in action, his wife gave birth to that third child. So you can see how terrible war is, because that guy is going to a place he had never heard of, but to places he had never heard of. And in one of those places he was killed in action, had never seen his third child. And Henry Morgan is also buried at the American Cemetery in Henry Chappelle. Well, if you ever visit Valkenburg, there are also a couple of uh, then and now pictures, of course. And on the top left, you can see men of the 19th Corps and Tomahawk and the 30th Infantry Division was part of the 19th Corps. And on the lower left, you can see the same spot, but that uh, taken in 2020, just like the picture on the right. And you can see a Sherman tank was just able to get through the gate. Um, but Falkenberg, as I told you, a lot of fighting had been going on. And it only took, uh, it took the Americans two days to cross the Gull Gif. And on the right hand side, you can see the picture where they crossed the Gull River for the first time. And nowadays there is a small bridge near the spot where they crossed the Gull River for the first time. And that bridge has been nicknamed the Old Hickory Bridge. And in Dutch it says Old Hickory Bridge. It marks the spot where the American liberators in September 1944 crossed the Gull River for the very first time. And Valkenburg was liberated completely on September the 17th. So quite some fighting had been going on. A lot of buildings had been damaged, especially by the Germans with their artillery. And there is one spot where you can still see the war damage. And one shell hit the building up here. And if you take a very close look, you can see that little statue inside. So the people are still praying and they are very thankful that that shall hit their building right at that spot and not somewhere else because most likely people were in the basement and they were unharmed. Well, Joel, I don't, I absolutely don't know how I'm here uh, time-wise right now because I don't have any, I don't have a clock or anything, but uh, I would like to find a couple of people who helped me with this presentation. Uh, I would like to thank my dad who was here to help me with the, taking pictures uh, last year and this year. I want to thank Jurgen Mengels for sharing his stories in Kadirinkeer and sharing the story of Albert Strahle. But mainly, I'm going to thank Jürgen for participating in the research about Albert Schaal and putting up the beautiful monument in Kadirinkir, because that's what we're doing it for, because we want to remember and pass the stories on to the next generation. Juri Beckers, thank you for your help with locating the exact spot of the Meuse River crossing in Maastricht. I would like to thank Bjorn Gerards, who really helped me in Valkenburg. And Ralf Sleismans for a couple of pictures he took last year. And I want to thank Joop Bernard for allowing me to use the, I have to say, the color, colorized maps because they are not mine. But if you took a good look, you could see they were sourced from a book, uh, The Bevrijding of IJsselmarigraat, The Liberation of the Municipality of IJsselmarigraat. And he's one of the authors of the book. So, well, um, I don't know how I'm doing right now so please get in if you have any questions i'm 
very happy to answer those questions. And I cannot hear you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Frank, I want to wait. thank you for this fantastic presentation. Uh, I learned a lot, especially from, from your region, all the way up from, from Groningen. Uh, are there people on Facebook, on YouTube, that had questions for, uh, for Frank? Let's have, have a look. I only see uh, compliments, uh, Frank, on Facebook. That's also uh, Thank really you very much. <laughs> people like your uh, presentation. So I, I see no questions on uh, on uh, on YouTube and also not on Facebook. I hope they're or... not. I hope they didn't fall asleep. So there no, are no. Oh no no! Everybody was uh, uh, pay attention to your presentation. Um, everybody, if you want to explore the area yourself, take a tour in the province of Limburg uh, with Frank. You see his website over here. And more over, uh, about his tours, you can find on on the website www.frankgubbels.com. Um, Frank, thank you. I'm for just going to say one yes. more thing because uh, for people who want to do a tour, well, we're not going to go into Belgium right now, obviously, obviously. but there are many more places to visit. And if you want to see a specific part or so, just let me know and we can visit that part as well. So yeah. feel uh, free to, to contact. Uh, if everything is allowed, then uh, I hope a lot of people are going on tours uh, with you, with us because uh, yeah, <laughs> they need to look uh, one year to online presentations and now they want to explore the area by them uh, by themselves. Uh, Frank, uh, again, uh, many thanks for this uh, great presentation. Next, uh, uh, next Tuesday, we will be back with guide Luc Buist, who will give a presentation, the first presentation. There are two presentations about glider pilots during the Battle of Arnhem. So we split it up in two sessions uh, in two weeks. So two online presentations from Luke Baus. Looking forward to, uh, to that presentation. Uh, Frank, thank you. Have a good evening. Take a beer. I'm still you too. making a lot here. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for joining in. And I hope it was really interesting for you. Joel, if you're ever in the area, just let me know. And I, I, I hear the beer is good in around. <laughs> the beer is good in Limburg. So, uh, yes. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much and everybody have a pleasant evening.